Jeff, it's it's always a pleasure to talk to you for uh, many reasons. One of them is that there's always uh, any number of dozens of directions that I feel uh, one can have a, a really fascinating conversation with you, dozens of topics, right? And and there's uh, there's certainly a couple we'll, we'll touch on today, um, but I do want to at some point dig in just for the, the viewers and the listeners to kind of get a, um, a heads up. I, I do really want to talk with you about your perspective as an American Russian um, right now, you know, living in Russia at a time where this, this kind of renewed Cold War is getting hotter and hotter. It's a really scary, stressful situation. And um, at least in terms of uh, American uh, athletes in the world of combat sports, I think you, you, you might have one of the most essential perspectives out there, not just because of your experiences and where you live, and, um, and, you know, and that you've got family, you know, all over the world, but also because you're, you're, you're an aware, engaged uh, person of the world. And so you have thoughts, you have opinions and, and stuff like that. So I do want to get into that a, a lot and, and, and really get into that because it's got to be um, a tough situation for you. And it's got to be a tough situation for a lot of people, you know, and we'd love to, to hear your thoughts on that. I would be remiss, however, if I didn't um, mention the fact that uh, you recently competed uh, again and uh, in, a, in a really uh, exciting fight, did bare knuckle uh, boxing. How did that come about, Jeff? Why did you decide uh, uh, to do it? I thought you were, I thought you were, uh, you were retiring before and then you went, I saw like, oh my gosh, he's funny again. You also specifically gave an opponent that you've beaten in MMA before uh, a chance to compete against you again, which is 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 pretty gracious and pretty noteworthy. What, how did this come about, and why did you decide to do it? Uh, well, he's been wanting to rematch forever, and um, you know, I just it's um, the bare knuckle thing was an opportunity for me to do something I'd never done before, and like like honestly, I mean, what do I do? I grapple, man. That's what I like to do. So, um, MMA is is not my favorite because you know i'm fighting you're kicking you're punching your elbow and your knee and all that stuff which i'd rather just grapple you know um but probably the bare knuckles probably my worst <laughs> nightmare as far as like a scenario where i'm fighting someone or like competing against someone so but also it's a challenge it's hard to pass up and it was just an opportunity for a challenge. So, um, like, they were actually, I talked to the guys today from Hardcore. So, it looks like we're going to have, like, because I beat him in MMA, he beat me in, in um, Bare Knuckle. And I'm really, really disappointed with my fight. Um, you know, I, I didn't do a lot of things that I practiced. And I just wish I had that third round over again to, um, you know, I think I could have, um, you know, I think I should have won. Um, I, you know, I, I didn't deserve to win the way, the way it went, you know, I'm not arguing with the decision. I just think the third round, um, I should have done some stuff different, um, like a couple of simple things that would have made a big difference. Um, so, um, yeah, anyway, we're talking about having a, a fight in June, an MMA, um, like a, uh, a, a trilogy, so to speak. So, um, yeah, I just, it's, it's kind of sad. I would like to just stop but it's um i can't stop on that note especially you know it's not like fight where i lost like i did my best like i i performed my best i was just better you know it's not one of those mm -hmm. um but i did train really hard for this fight I'm, I'm like i'm really happy it's like the first time in a lot of years i had like a legitimate camp where i trained hard and and so that was good but it was also disappointing that the result of the fight not not the result win or lose, but that result of the action of the fight wasn't what I like had hoped for you know, or planned for. So you said that this is the first time in a number of years you were able to to train really really hard in camp. Was that because of uh, of injuries and in, in previous ones or, or other others other reasons? Yeah, I mean, a lot of it was travel. I mean, you know, because traveling from the U.S. to Russia, U.S. to Russia, my family, this and that. A lot of it was injuries. You know, had much, a bunch of surgeries. Um, yeah, like a ton of a ton of injuries and stuff like that. And that's and that's why I think I put on. I think I was on Facebook and I put a big long thing why I was retiring and stuff like that. Um, 
and then of course I did this fight, but I, the injury, you know, I found it's crazy. I found there's this um, older lady in, in the city I live in and um, her assistant kind of like saw me walk in the mall hobbling and he's like, oh, you have back problems. I'm like, yeah. He's like, oh, come, she'll, she'll, this lady will help you for free. I'm like, okay, I have nothing to lose. And man, she's like a, a godsend. I go like every couple of weeks and she just like, I got on you know, like she's a chiropractor mm. slash orthopedist slash something. And she just like, it's her whole life. She works like 12 hours a day, six days a week, literally. And um, she just helps people. And she helped me out a lot. So um, she just put me in a position where um, I could compete again. So, you know, I, there I am doing it. So. You were moving, you were moving uh, well uh, on your feet, certainly, you know, different than, you know, like you talked about hobbling, you know, we've seen videos yeah. of you in between fights and stuff where because of injuries, mm -hmm. you're hobbling. Was that, uh, you, you, you're feeling better or can you just like with motion, just like when you're fighting, you turn it on and you can move regardless <laughs> or are you, are you walking around without, without limping these days? Um, I think it's a little bit of both. Um, yeah, I think when I want to fight, you can kind of turn it on, but, um, yeah, I'm, I'm definitely getting around better, you know? So, um, yeah, I was happy. I was happy that I trained hard for fight. I mean, that was, that was half of it, honestly, because, you know, and like when you're, when you're injured and you're, or you're traveling back and forth all the time between the U S and Russia, like I was before, and it's just hard to like, you just can't train for a fight like you need to train you can train you can work out and there's a difference between working out every day and training for a fight and i was working out but i wasn't training mm -hmm. like i should have been like when i was you know um living in florida with american top team training for a fight and so i trained for this fight so i was like really happy that i dedicated myself to like the training and stuff but it was also very hard i remember why i loved it and i remember why i hated it at the mm -hmm. same time I could understand. Did you did did you do your whole camp then in uh, in Russia there at home? Yeah, I did my whole camp in Russia. Did you already have coaches that you knew you were going to use for this, or did you have to go out and find people specifically? I knew I knew a coach I was going to use for this, uh, a boxing coach, uh, Dennis. I uh, lives in Ufa City, I live in. He just he was great, um, good good boxer. But he's he was just dedicated. Like he's a friend, and he's just he was just dedicated to the whole you know, situation. So that's excellent. Was there any difference that you all took into account and adapted training because it was um, with your, with your knuckles exposed, or do you really not overthink it and say, Hey, we just, there's only so much we can do. Let's just train boxing. We just train boxing. Mm -hmm. And, um, you know, it was nice. We, we trained boxing, but you know, we did, we did rounds of boxing and then we did it without the gloves, but, but not sparring without gloves. Um, and it, it was, it was so nice, you know, not having big boxing gloves on, but holy man, I'll tell you what, and I I'm shocked, but there's a big difference, a big difference between fighting MMA with a little tiny fonts gloves and fighting bare knuckle with no gloves because mm. man, it, you feel it a lot more and I, I was shocked i mean shocked the difference that the little four the protection those little four ounce gloves which i thought they gave no protection but they they do protection so to your head or to your hand uh to your face uh, <laughs> i gotcha. mean when you get hit when you get hit by the bare knuckle wow it's and you feel it man <laughs> like not just like the cutting but like your head getting rocked yeah wow. by rocked by rocked yeah wow wow yeah, little yeah gloves, that's offered some protection i didn't think they did but have you i i guess i should know this i feel bad i don't have you ever fought what is now called mma but without gloves before did you ever do like a violetudo fight without gloves no, no i never have no. I always had yeah i always had a. you know i did i did i i did uh some pancreation fights without ah. gloves back but but it wasn't you had you couldn't you had to slap you yeah, yeah. You punch to and, and to accept to the body and um so yeah it's completely different so i could imagine yeah i mean because if you're doing freestyle fighting and bare knuckle like the way we used to see it it's it 
it's a it could be i'm imagining it could be a little bit safer just because people aren't punching as much because you got other options right but bare knuckle right. boxing is seems especially yeah. dangerous because you don't have the option of taking them down or you know clinching for too long that's yeah. that's that no that's incredible is now you all are talking about another mma fight between you and alexander emilianenko um well, he well, I mean, you you boxed him. He's a he's a tall, true heavyweight yeah. and a boxer. What about how about a, a how about a submission grappling match? You wouldn't do that. Uh, huh? You won't agree to that. But I, <laughs> I'm, I'm, I'm okay with MMA because I'm not gonna I'm gonna be standing up for very long. <laughs> <laughs> fair enough. Fair enough. No, that's good. I hope I hope that goes through. That'll be that'll be excellent to to watch. Jeff, when did you? I want to. Transition now to talk a little bit more about the uh, the, the public affairs stuff. Um, when did you move full time to to live in Russia? What year was it? Do you remember? Yeah, I mean it's been, I would say, like three and a half years. Like okay. Full, maybe maybe close to four years full time. Okay, cool. And when when you moved there, and when you moved to where you are now, when you you know, went there full time. How aware were you or of, of, um, of, I mean, shoot, it's tough. It's always so interesting to where we start the clock with, with this, right? We can go back to 1917 or when the U S invaded yeah. Russia secretly during World War one, we can go to, uh, we can go to, uh, when Truman, president Truman took over and went back on FDR's promises to the style. And we can go to, um, when they created uh, NATO and didn't want to admit uh, Russia, but admitted Germany in like 1955, we can go back to the early 90s when they had another big expansion of NATO and putting weapons on Russia's border. But I was thinking of 2014 um, with whether people want to call it a revolution or a coup. And I think those two things can coexist. I think they were po popular there was clearly popular sentiment against Ukraine's president at the time, who clearly, you know, like most leaders, wasn't a great guy and had corruption. And there were a lot of leftists that were opposed to him. What we know for a fact, and it's documented, the United States, even though there was popular revolutionary sentiment, the United States went in and armed militia groups, specifically literal Nazi groups, um, and, uh, and and continues to give money to them. And uh, on the record, what went in and uh, even contrary to like U European Union's wishes, really had a hand in choosing who the next government would be. So like a lot of revolutions, if people want to call it a revolution, it, it definitely had elements of, uh, of a coup. How aware were you of those events of 2014? Anyway, you want to characterize them, right? Like people can, yeah. can have, can characterize it whatever way they want. I'm not trying to dictate that. But how aware were you of that specifically of, at that point, Ukraine, the, the government that was overturned, um, they reportedly wanted to have a balance between, hey, we want to do business with Russia. We have a lot of uh, uh, ethnic Russian people here. Yeah. We do a lot of trade with Russia. And we want to do business with Europe, of course. You know, we want to, we just want to be neutral. And they specifically didn't want to join NATO like the United States and had wanted them to for a while. Um, uh, then they, because of that, a lot of people say, a lot of experts argue um, that, that government was was uh, was helped along out. Um, how aware were you of that situation when you moved to Russia with the tensions between uh, Ukraine and Russia? Of course, um, you know, even before that too, we, we had um, um, Russian troops that had a lease uh, and a naval base in Crimea, then ended up um, also, um, you know, uh, taking Crimea. Uh, for Russia, how aware were you of all this? These types of things uh, when you moved were very much so, or not really? Um, yeah, I was very aware of it when I when I moved to Russia, and in fact, um, in 2016, um, two two years after the coup, and it, it was a revolution and a coup. I agree with you completely. It was um, uh, Victor the the president? He was terrible. Like uh, he was corrupt. He was like not a good leader. He was, you know, in bed with with Russia and um, wasn't look out for the people. I mean, they're having people were hungry in this, and he was like he was stealing from them. He was a terrible guy. Um, but I mean, it was still a coup. And like you said, the U.S. the CIA had a hand in it. They armed um, right wing, far right wing, not literally Nazi groups, not neo Nazi, but like Nazi groups um that that uh took over 
um, and and in, in ignited this this revolution, if you want to call it a coup. Um, so I was very aware of it. But in 2016, I, I started actually going to the former eastern part of Ukraine in Lugansk and Donetsk, the two republics that declared independence. Um, I was invited by them to meet the people and talk to the people and and get a, a clear understanding of what was going on. And man, it, it opened my eyes because um, for for eight years, you know, uh, since 2014, and I've been I've been knowledgeable of the situation intimately for six years. And during these last six years, I've gone probably almost a dozen times to Lugansk and Donetsk. Um, and so, and actually, I'm um, with me and my my buddy are doing a documentary, and we we filmed um, two different times, two a couple different week spans. We were there filming, um, interviewing people, you know, like uh, like showing the damage, showing like you know what really happened, the people's take on it, and not a not a like a military. This is what happened with war, like, but a documentary on hey look at the people here. This is like that people being affected by this war and that's what's going on. So anyway, not uh, get to your question. Yeah, I've known about it for a long time. Um, and I got to know a lot of the people there. Actually, one of my, one of my friends just got killed two days ago. Um, he was, uh, he's in the army of uh, Donetsk and he was, it was during a ceasefire and he was excavating, you know, free people, in a corridor a safety corridor and some snipers just like open fire on him and some of the civilians killed five civilians and him um so it's unfortunate but um yeah i'm sure there's some, some tragic stories on on both sides of this but um i do want to say um kind of like i know i'm getting out a little off here but um for the last eight years um you know these people of eastern ukraine um, like Donetsk and Lugansk have been under, you know, this war has been going on for eight years that the world knows about it in the last two weeks. Like, you know, like, you know, there was some problem in Ukraine in 2014 and, you know, everybody forgot about it in a month. Everybody forgot about it a month, but the people there have been living this for eight years and for the last eight years, and, and this is without exaggeration because I've been there you know, the last six years, I was there just three months ago. Um, these people have been um, getting mortared, getting bombed, getting shot, killed um, by the Ukrainian army, and and they're targeting civilians. They're targeting the hospitals, the schools, the apartment complexes, um, the mall, the city centers, um, where there's no military. They blew up the airport, but there's no military at all. They're just randomly shooting every day for eight years like uh, on christmas day on new year's day it doesn't matter like just like clockwork it starts uh pre-dawn and then periodically through the day i mean you send your kid to school you don't know if your kid's going to come back at night so and this has been going on every day for the last eight years and like it's really sad the world didn't know about it um and i'm you know being, being who I am, being an anarchist, I'm, I'm absolutely against war of, of all natures. I'm against this war going on right now. Um, but, you know, this this has been going on for eight years. And, you know, I've intimately known some of the people who have been killed, some of the um, kids now who I contact with are orphans because of because of this war and stuff. So um, I just... I just want to say this, you know, the world, and I did know this when I moved to Russia, you know, I was already involved in, in this situation. And, um, but uh, in Donetsk and Lugansk, and you know, these, these people, it's in the, it's in the Ukraine, I do also want to say it's in the Ukrainian constitution that, um, that you can, that the republics, the separate republics can vote, they can have referendums to be um, independent if they want, like, and it's part of the, the Ukrainian constitution, and they, um, they voted, both uh, Donetsk and Lugansk voted uh, on a referendum, it was like well over 90% of both decided not to be part of Russia, but to be um, independent, um, sovereign republics, sovereign nations. And, um, you know, uh, Ukraine, uh, you know, refused to recognize this, cut off the, cut off the water, cut off the gas, um, and then attacked them. Only then, only then did they um, fight back. And uh, like I said, they... Um, it's been 
you know, and also contrary to Western media, I, I also, I'm sorry, I want to go off on a tangent, but it's yeah, just been really right. frustrating. Um, listening to West, uh, listening to the media, um, they got, oh, when Russia invaded in 2014, like Russia never invaded. The Russia never militarily never set foot in Ukraine, in Eastern Ukraine, in Donetsk, never. They did they did troops did not troops, but did volunteers come over from from Russia and help the people of Lugansk and Donetsk? Yes. Did Russia supply medical? Did Russia uh, hook up their gas, their heat? their water yes but russian troops russian tanks russian military equipment never crossed the border into lugansk and donetsk other than volunteers like just regular people off the street picking up their rifles or guns and coming over and helping helping the militia and and that's been the extent of the help other than humanitarian aid until now jeff what's the what's your understanding your impressions from from going to Eastern uh, Ukraine, uh, now these these uh, these, you know, these autonomous regions and these ones who voted, um, who, who from all all credible reports, they clearly do want to be, um, you know, independent. The violence against them. I've read reports. It's been over fourteen thousand people killed by the Ukrainian army in the last eight years. Is it? What's your impression of why it's happening? Is it because these were hotbeds of of, uh, of, of uh, independence movements and because they're, they're resource rich, they have a lot of oil there. So they wanted to tamp down, uh, um, you know, the, these, these notions of independence. Is it, is it anti-ethnic uh, Russian bigotry? Is it a combination or other things? Man, it, that, that's, a, that's such a good question. It's, um, you know, it's, it's not the, the resource, you know, the, it's, it's the coal. They have a lot of coal there mm -hmm. and they, they've blown up um, you know, obviously one of the first things that the army did was, was Ukrainian army was destroy the mine. So like, there's no work. Um, so there's no, there's no coal extraction right now, but I, I, I think it's just punitive, you know, because these, these people don't want to be part of Ukraine and, and there, there's these leaflets that they put all over, um, before they started the bombing campaign, uh, they shut off the gas and they shut off the water and stuff. And, the, and so they get people like hungry and I mean, cold and had no water. And they put a leaflets all over, like, and like just saying, if you want to be part of, uh, if you want to eat or you want to be like, don't freeze to death and have like drink, like you better like rejoin your brothers in Ukraine, you know, like just like crazy stuff, like, like propaganda posters and stuff. And then they, you know, I, I was when I was there, not last time, but the time before, you know, I went to the city center and there's this, it's just such an iconic uh, photo. It's like, I, I posed with this photo, they, they left this, it's like a missile shot by the Ukrainian army and it landed in the city center, like right in the, the middle of like where the mall is and the, and the post office and all this stuff. And it doesn't blow up. It doesn't, it doesn't explode. It's a, uh, it's like a, uh, it looks like a you know a long missile, probably like ten feet long. When it lands, these propeller things open up in it, and it fires like a machine gun, like a rotating machine gun in like three different areas of it goes brrr, and just destroy it. And it sh it shoots uh, not bullets but sh shrapnel and and some other things like just in a circle for like two minutes, like in three different like like places and saying it's only designed to kill people it's not designed to blow up to destroy a building to blow up a tank i mean it's just as it and it was shot right in the city center it's still there as a like um, a monument and it, it's just to kill people and like who what people is are in the city center in the mall i mean civilians going going to work going to shop going to you know bring their kids to the park that's exactly where we're shot i mean it's just but that's that's the you know i, I visited you know twice an orphanage where you know parents and stuff have lost their life and these aren't like uh our veterans of war or, or like uh soldiers you know these are just like people oh and in i was oh two o'clock in the morning a bomb hit our house everybody was killed except for you know this kid you know the whole family was killed except for this kid now he's in an orphanage and it's like 
I know in war, and, I, and I'm sure there's some stories on the other side now with Russia bombing um, Ukraine and, and some people are going to say, you know what, they, they hit a hospital too, or, you know, these people, civilians were killed. And I have no doubt because war is terrible and I disagree with all of it, but they, these uh, people are, there's no military in these areas where they're, where they're being shot. And there was, all they wanted was independence. I mean, these people aren't even fighting. They're just, they go, we just want independence. So there was no, um, you know, there's a military zone or whatever where there's fighting going on, but they're just lobbing every day into civilian areas. And it's like, to me, it's just, you, it, it, it can't be used to win a war because it's just killing civilians. You're not, you're not getting any targets that are going to help you win a war. To me, it's just a punitive, like, oh, you don't want to be with us? Well, then, okay, this is what, you know, we got for you. I, I mean, I, I've been there so many times in the last six years. I just, like, I, I've wrapped my head around that question so many times. And that's the only thing I can think of. It's just, it's punitive because it has no, it has no place in humanity. It has no place in not even to, you can't even argue that it's beneficial to, you know, now these people obviously aren't going to go, okay, now I'm going to join Ukraine again because Ukrainians are killing us. No, <laughs> I mean, it's, so anyway, I, I, I don't know. I don't, actually don't even know. No, but that's really good context. I mean, again, it's, it's, you know, war of aggression is a war crime. So Russia is committing a war crime by invading. Yes, it's just important to contextualize and say, that's not the first war crime to occur in, in Eastern Ukraine, right? There have been civilians being targeted and murdered, many of them ethnically Russian. Uh, so it's like, we can't just start the, start the attention or start the shot clock when Russia government did a bad thing and ignore the U.S. backed, um, U.S. controlled NATO supported actions of the Ukrainian government and, and, and decontextualize it. Again, I, you know, for, for what it's worth, I'm also an anarchist, so I, I don't really like any of these, you know, I don't really like any large institution or any of these governments either, but we have to provide context. It's, you know, the, the propaganda here is definitely one-sided. And I wanted to talk about that with you. I've, you know, you're American and you're living in Russia. How much, how much, um, I want to talk about, you know, the, the Russian propaganda too, but first, how much uh, exposure do you have? How much access do you have to American propaganda, whether it's social media, whether it's our news, whatever, like how much, how much do you feel you, you know, talking with your friends in America and seeing what you're seeing, do you feel like you're getting a sense of, of what the messaging and the propaganda is here in the United States? Oh, absolutely. I see it every day, but not only through friends and, um, you know, I have access to the watching the media there and, and stuff like that. It's just, it's mind boggling <clears throat> because it's just, it's so one-sided and it's so like, it's just, some things are just absolutely not true and some things are just completely ignored, you know? Mm -hmm. um, and I have to say like context is a, is a, is a good word. I, I do, I agree with, um, this war right now like with russia inside ukraine actually no i do not however like what it, it so i want to make that clear i do not because i'm not justifying it i'm not like apologist for it but what is the context you know the context of western media is oh uh, putin's crazy he wants to take over ukraine and he can't give up the old ussr and he's trying to build the russian empire again and this them come on first of all russia has no ability military wise or um like economically to invade and um occupy ukraine they cannot it's impossible but ukraine doesn't want to be it's, i mean i think they learned their lesson the united states learned their lesson from afghanistan you can't invade a country that doesn't want to be occupied or occupy a country that doesn't want to be part of your you know part of your um country so that can't happen but what, why, why, why did Russia invade? You know, for the last, since, uh, for 15 years, uh, Vladimir Putin's been warning the United States, warning NATO, saying, hey, look, you can't have Ukraine as part of NATO. You cannot, um, in 1990, you know, George Bush the first made a promise, like, very famous, not one inch more, not one inch more. If Germany was allowed to become, when it unified was to, become part of the West, um, part of NATO. Um, uh, Russia would take all of its troops out of East Germany and uh, Russia would allow 
um, uh, Germany to be part of NATO, part of the West, but there would be no more NATO countries added. Since then, since that promise, 14 countries have been added, including former republics of Lithuania, Estonia, um, you know, uh, promises to Georgia, promises to um, um, uh, uh, Ukraine. How, and, 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 and people, as Russia built up a mass of 120,000 troops on the border of Ukraine um, in the last couple of weeks, Kamala Harris, the vice president, went to Ukraine during this, you know, Putin is saying, hey, you can't have, you can't, uh, you can't, can't be part of NATO. Camilla Harris, in a, in a public speech in front of like, uh, in front of the government of, and, and Zelensky and part of the, uh, and the government of Ukraine said, we welcome you to NATO. We, we can't wait for you to be part of NATO. We're looking forward to it. This is like a, it'll be a great day for Ukraine, a great day for the United States and NATO. Wow. Like the very, I mean, how how much more provocation can you can you get you know people people don't understand nato is a military agreement a military agreement that was formed after um the warsaw pact after the ussr and and several countries made the warsaw pact and it was a it was a, it was a direct um counterbalance to the warsaw pact with, with ussr well when there's no more ussr there's no more Warsaw countries. Um, there's no more like conflict, you know, threat of Russia invading Europe or anything like that. So what what is the point of NATO? And what is the point? Of, it's a military. It's not the European Union. It's not an economic group trying to help each other out or looking for economic betterment of each country. It's a purely military um, agreement between countries, and and it's all aimed at Russia and. And then Russia, you know, and the Western, we talk about the Western uh, media and like the, what I hear is like the Western media, like all the time, they're like, oh, what's he up to? What's Putin up to? Why, why is he going to uh, invade? Oh, he did it again. Why did he invade? Oh, because he's crazy. No, it's, it's for a simple reason. One, for the security of right. And like I said, it sounds like I'm being an apologist and I'm, I'm, I'm supporting this uh, war. I'm not, I am not, but I'm just saying the context. I'm, I'm just saying the reason. I'm not justifying the reason, but I'm saying the reason they invaded was one reason. Um, the main reason was the was the NATO with, with their own security, and they for them to pull out. They they've said um, they want these simple things. They want uh, Ukraine to say, okay, we're not going to be part of NATO. Like take it out of their constitution that they're going to be part of NATO. They want them to acknowledge Khmer as part of, of Russia. And the third is they want to acknowledge, they want them to acknowledge Donetsk and Lugansk as separate, not Russian, but separate entities, re, uh, independent republics. Those things, if uh, Zelensky and Ukraine um, agree to those things, they said, we'll pull out tomorrow or we're gone. We don't want, we don't want to occupy Ukraine, we want part of Ukraine. And again, I want to say again, I'm sorry, I'm not justifying this war, but these are things you're not going to hear in the Western media. You, you, all you're going to hear is Putin's crazy. He wants to start a war. He, he wants to take over Ukraine. He's now he's coming for Europe and all this stuff, man. That's not true. He'd want the security. People don't. I mean, Russia made a made a, a non-aggression pact with Germany, right? In 1937, two years later, they were attacked. They were like, we lost 27 million people, 27 million. Then they made an agreement with, with the United States about NATO in 1990. The United States like didn't uh, all pull their, you know, in 14, 14 more countries, including former Soviet republics. So um, all, all I can say about this is if the United States all of a sudden, or no, if, if sorry, if Russia all of a sudden became really friendly with Canada, um, a new, and then there was a coup and a new prime minister of Canada came in there and it was all pro-Russian and all of a sudden pro, uh, you know, Russian government and Russia was military installments and nuclear arms and bases and stuff were put on Canada right on the United States border. There's no way, absolutely no way the United States would 
um, put up with this for one second. I mean, we saw this 1962 Cuban Missile Crisis when they wouldn't even allow it in Cuba. There's no way they would allow anything like that at their border. Yet, the United States through NATO has surrounded Russia with, with military bases, including nuclear bases. And, the, and they're like, what? Why is, he, why is Russia so upset? Why is, like, it's, it's crazy. It's just, it's propaganda. But you don't, you don't hear this in, in uh, no, the Western media. You don't. And, and, you know, and as well, like there in, in recent years alone, um, Russia has been denied. Russia has proposed like, hey, how about uh, how about we do with 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 bordering countries? Like, how about you all? Um, we do a, a trade agreement that's Russia, this country and Europe. And they're like, no, no, we just got to cut you out. You're not you're not going to be involved in that. The United States in recent years has also pulled out of inter, uh, intermediate range uh, missile treaties with Russia. So right. as they're doing, they're, they, they do coups on their border, install friendly governments to the United States uh, after we've had missiles pointed at Russia for over half a century, right? Before Russia yeah. put their missiles in, in, in Cuba, we had ours in Turkey pointed at them, right? Like, right. And, and it continues to this day. Um, we, were, we try to isolate them economically. We've long had sanctions against Russia. Like these new ones are, yeah. are particularly rough and bad. I want to hear your, your take on how things uh, are being, how people are being affected by them now. But this is, this is nothing new. We try to isolate Russia. We try to surround them uh, with, with weapons. We try to control the governments, boarding them and put uh, weapons in those governments. We try to uh, exclude them from, uh, from, from uh, international uh, trade agreements as well. It, it's just it's just context. I don't like any of the leaders. I don't like Vladimir Putin any more than I like Joe Biden. And I know to Americans that probably sounds really crazy that I would equate the two. Yeah. But Joe Biden's death toll is a lot longer than just about wow. anyone on earth. In the last 50 years, if you want to take the carceral system that he helped uh, create and, and lock up more people in any country on earth per capita or total, yeah. if we want to count this, this, uh, this, the spied system that we have, this domestic spying system um, that, that came out of uh, the Patriot Act, which is really largely based on something he helped uh, write in the uh, in the early in the uh, in the mid '90s. We want to take all that into account, and and the wars he supported, which have killed uh, just you know just one example, the Iraq War, which he really got on this and stumped hard for. It's killed over a million people. Like. Americans, uh, as, as a government, uh, have way more blood on our hands than the other place. And we have we are certainly the aggressor um, if we look at full, full context. And, and the propaganda here is crazy. I was just at the, the gym, uh, the, our gym, uh, Jeff. We are in uh, inner city Chicago in the near southwest side in uh, the Pilsen neighborhood. And uh, I was there. I was there, there every day. But yesterday, I was driving and I noticed a, an area where they, they put ads for um, like movies or albums, totally, you know, ad space area. It's not like a, it's not a place where people put their punk rock band stickers up for shows. It's, it's, it's sold, you know, ad space. They put up movies and stuff. I saw professionally done um, uh, uh, ads there for, it said support Ukraine. And it said um, no fly zone over Ukraine. There's a big movie oh here in Chicago, professionally say, try to uh, manufacture consent for specifically no fly zone over Ukraine. And for a little bit of context, I'm certainly not a military expert for our readers, uh, our, our readers, our viewers, our listeners, um, whatever, who, whoever you side with, whether it's a government or people or whatever the case may be, a no, enforcing a no fly zone means conventional and direct, uh, or at least conventional, it could escalate to nuclear, but it means direct military engagement between the United States and Russia. It means direct war yeah. hot war between them so wh whatever we think about it that means an escalation in the war it means direct involvement uh militarily of the united states and our troops and russia and and their troops and and that's being pushed down it's being it's being a no-fly zone which is definitionely an escalation of of uh, of uh, uh and an increase in the temperature of direct warfare is being posited and positioned as a peace movement and yeah. I feel, and I feel that's really, I don't know, I, I'm speaking out of term, but I feel that it's really anti-Ukrainian because while Russia does not have the capability, I think you're right, to even occupy Ukraine long-term and certainly not to invade all of Europe or to, you know, invade no. the United States or whatever, Ukraine can't 
beat Russia's military. So we can no. arm them and we can hand out weapons. Zelensky, President Zelensky can hand out uh, rifles to babies all he wants. But the reality is they're just going to be cannon fodder. The more yep. we are, if the United States, I feel, if you, and you can disagree, if the United States uses our power to arm Ukraine instead of using our power to do what like China's asking <coughs> for and, and, and try to get a ceasefire and get peace, all we're doing is killing more U Ukrainians. In, in my view, it's it that's and and yet it's being posited as a as a peace movement. It's really disconcerting it's, to see. What you just said can't be more accurate because Ukraine has no chance to win this war, zero percent chance. Uh, like I said, they they could if if Russia changed its policy and decided to try to occupy, which they won't. Um, either, that's not even their stated goal. But um, by just defeating Ukraine. Ukraine can't win this war. So the longer it goes on, the more people are going to die, the more civilians are going to die. So as the United States, which they are now um, arming, continue to arm Ukraine, and Zelensky keeps this war progressing, um, more and more people are going to lose their lives needlessly, needlessly, because there's no, there's no, there's no end game to this war that's not going to end um, unless there's, it turns into something bigger with NATO, U.S. involved. But with just Ukraine and Russia, Russia's going to win the war. And when they do, um, if they keep the agreement that they said, like, look, Ukraine be, just don't join NATO. You can keep your government. You can keep your sovereignty. Um, and we're going to, we're going to, we're leaving. Um, but you got to recognize Khmer and the, and the two independent republics. That's what, that's all they want, right? Um, anything, anything, in the meantime, it's just more lost lives until that happens. So um, by United States is, I mean, maybe I'll get in trouble for Russia for saying this for people, but um, Ukraine's like, they got put in the middle of this bad situation because NATO and the United States like basically left them out to dry. And, but they knew they couldn't come to support. Otherwise you're gonna, you got no fly zone being, um, put in. You're talking about World War Three. That's what's happened because the Russia cannot back out at this point. Russia, at this point, they've stated their goals. They've used their military force. They've, you know, um, Vladimir Putin's reputation as as the president of of Russia, and everything's on the line. There's no way without some kind of um, deal that that like what I said, like the, the three things, the three points that he says, without something like that, um, there, there's going to be no end to this. So um, for the United States to keep giving weapons to Ukraine and um, keep telling Zelensky to not give up and stuff, but like not give up what? Not give up, you, like you're just losing more and more people and it's a war. And as much as Russia says, and I do hope I, I believe this, and I, I hope it's true that they're not, you know, targeting, they're only targeting military um, installations and stuff like that. People are dying. I know a hospital got hit. I know apartment buildings are getting hit. I know civilians are dying. Um, and I, I, this is going to happen during a war. And so um, until this Zelensky decides he's had enough and um, you know, if the United States was actually supporting the people, if they cared about the people of Ukraine, they would they would say, you know what, enough's enough. Um, let's let's negotiate a peace deal. You know, keep your government there, keep your keep your the autonomy of of um, of uh, Ukraine, and let's just end this and and make the as as good of a peace deal as we can. But you know that they're not interested in that at this point. What's we talked now a bit as as Americans about about American propaganda. What what are you seeing out there? Like what's uh, what's the Russian line? What's the Russian propaganda like? As far as you can see, I see that there's a lot of demonstrations, a lot of anti-war demonstrations in the streets of different cities of Russia. Uh, I'm sure I'm sure there's an official line or two out there. What, what do you see out there that's that's official narratives or official lines um, that uh, that you would call propaganda coming from uh, the Russian uh, government and or you know the corporate media um, well I mean first I have to say yeah I mean there are people protesting um, 
it's not, you know, in the Western media, they're, they're showing people protesting in the streets and stuff. It's not something I've seen. I, it has happened. It's, I'm not denying it's happened. But, um, but probably 90, more than 95% of Russians support like what's going on right now. They support like the, you know, I mean, there, but people, you got to remember like Ukraine and Russia used to be the one country. So there's a lot of Russians, even though they might support Russia and want, like everybody wants this to end. Or nobody wants the, to continue. Nobody wants to take over Ukraine and, and make it part of Russia and, and have Russia and Ukrainians killed. They're like, oh, those don't need Ukrainians. No, it's not like that. They're Ukrainians, like our brothers. Why are we, why are we shooting Ukrainians? Even, even the people where like most people who are supportive of, of the Russian military suppress, um, supporting Putin in this, they don't want it. They would wish it would end tomorrow. Um, but saying that, um, you know, some, some words, some languages that, you know, nobody's calling it a invasion. Everybody's, you know, the official... Um, I guess the the propaganda where the the is saying it's a military mission, mm -hmm. you know, and you know, and um, kind of my my some something uh, you know, I I wouldn't talk about here so much. Um, now I talk about my friends is you know these people of the Nazi Lugans have been suffering bomb for eight years, eight years, right? Why and Russia helped them out with gas, with, with like humanitarian, you know, but that was like their big, they only recognized them as independent republics a week ago or two weeks ago. Like why did it and take that, so long? Yeah, why, why, if you, if that's the reason, that, that's one of the declared reasons for the, the invasion and you can't, you're not, you can't call it an invasion here, but that's what it was, invasion. And that was, that's, well, why did why did you wait eight years to do it? That wasn't, that's not the real reason, you know, like they, um, this, the people have been suffering for eight years. So, you know, the real reason, um, I mean, it's, it's plain and simple is, you know, they, they just got, they just can't have Ukraine being part of NATO and then they need that buffer and they just demand that Ukraine be um, at least neutral, you know, not, not part of Russia, not part of NATO, but just its own independent sovereign country with, um, militarily neutral. So, mm -hmm. no, thank you. That's, 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 uh, I appreciate that. I, I was, you know, this is, uh, I, I was curious about a, a few different things. I wanted to talk about different restrictions going on, um, imposed by the United States, imposed by Russia. Um, first off, there's, there's set whole new set of like, of, of sanctions put on Russia by the United States. Are, are you all in Russia, people around you or anyone you're hearing from, are you all feeling any effect of, of these yet? Or is there a fear of, um, uh, of the effect, possible effect of these types of sanctions or banning, you know, Russian oil and, and stuff like that? Um, yeah, I mean, people are afraid. I'm, I'm afraid. <laughs> people, people are afraid. Um, so, like, what, uh, just in general, it has affected some people um the what, what i'm seeing just here in this city like how it's affected me individually um or just the group of people that i that i see every day is that you know like i see long lines at the bank people withdrawing their money that's true i see people at atms like getting their money out that's true i see the ruble you know when i when i first start coming to russia like long ago in 2011 uh the ruble is like 32 rubles to a dollar um, and then, you know, with sanctions and this and that, it was like 75 rubles for a dollar for, for many years about that. Now it's about 145 rubles to a dollar just in the last like week and a half because of these sanctions. So, um, you know, and money's worth a lot, like half as much as it was, you know, a week and a half ago. So that, that's really, that's terrible. <laughs> so, um, anyway, like I can't, I can't send Western Union. I can't, uh, um, send by bank, you know, uh, money, money back to the United States for my kids, anything like that. So that's affected me directly. Um, and even if I could like to exchange the ruble to the dollar to have it sent, it would be worth half as much as it was, you know, a week ago or two, a week and a half ago. So 
that way it would be terrible even if even if i could which i can't so and then of course all the flights i, I was actually going to be i was supposed to be in the u.s uh two days ago um but all the flights you know got canceled like a you know a week or so ago so it's not i mean in order to go to the u.s i have to go to italy and then from italy like buy a different ticket to go to the u.s or go to turkey and then buy a different ticket from turkey there's no like connection from here to turkey to us but i'd have to make two separate days so the cost obviously is exorbitant you know exorbitant to try to get back and forth to the us and and there so um these are the issues i mean, then of course uh my facebook's been you know facebook shut down i heard instagram's being shut down as of like now as of midnight tonight so i think there's no more instagram um if whatsapp i heard that's next on the chopping block if that gets blocked then you know that's i don't know i think using viber or something like that but it's like it's going to be hard to like all my connections to people in the u.s my family stuff can be blocked um and this just this is my issue of course people are having much more issues than this you know especially that economy um the economy yeah if they block the with with if they really uh go through with the oil um embargo it's going to be it's going to be a struggle because uh, Russia really depends on that. So, um, yeah, nobody, I mean, I, number one, for the humanitarian reason, number two, like, I don't like the war, but also for like, just my, my own, you know, getting my relationships in the United States, with my family and stuff like that, it's, it's being like hurt, hurt badly because of this. So um, I, I really, you know, looking forward to the end of this conflict. Of course, yeah, no, and like, and it's good of you to have perspective and say, hey, there's people, of course, suffering more. But I mean, this is this is real. Like, you're a working man, and you you know you work you work for a living, and you've got you're in an interesting position, like many other people in the world, where you've got family where you live, and you've got family in another country, and issues of communication, of remittance, sending back money. I'm sure you yeah. you provide support for your your, yeah. your child in America. Like yeah. these are these are practical things of like, wait, wait, how do I help my family? How do I stay in touch with my family? How do I like this is um, other than God forbid people that some people that are uh, um, you know uh, being killed. You know this type of stuff affects you and even affects your earning power, right? Because you have to your yeah. your earning power has to coexist on multiple continents, obviously, right? Yeah, what yeah. you earn in Russia has to be good in, in, in America. It's not right. just like, oh, Jeff can't do a, a million dollar seminar in Miami next month. Like it's no, you've got you've got family to support a family to be in communication mm -hmm. with. And, and that takes uh, a, a real material toll and a real psychic toll. I I'd imagine does it? Do you feel like there's anything you can do? Do you feel like, oh, I, I've got to look into I mean, you know, making changes, or do you feel like this is this? Is, I, don't, I don't know what I can do. I live here, and this is just the way it is, and we just hope that there's a, a resolution soon. I, I, yeah, I don't know what to do. You know, I, I, I can't. Uh, you know, as far as myself, like I just, you know, I try to, um, you know, talk to people about what's really going on, and kind of put the the narrative in perspective to say, look, like I said, I've you know a million times already. I don't support this war, but. This is why it's going on and and let's let's all you know hope it ends and and get back but um you know i i do understand there's a lot more people you know obviously people like being bombed and and killed and people on like shooting and getting shot at and stuff like that um and their families are are a lot you know have more more to uh bear with this this conflict than i do but it is affecting a lot of people and in russia i mean there's there's poor i mean just to give you an idea, I was at the mall tonight with my daughter, and I'd never been to this mall before. Um, in this, I'm, I'm in a I'm in a city called Ufa, which is kind of at the base of the Ural Mountains. Um, but there's like a billion, three million three hundred thousand people here, so it's it's a big city. Um, but I was in a mall today, and I went. Um, I, I usually don't go to these places so much because it's like photos, photos, photos. But we went down. Um, you know, went down the first floor and it's like a market where they sell, um, you know, people are bringing in nuts and fruit and meat and stuff to sell. And man, I just got a real, it reminded me of when I was in like uh, Philippines or Nicaragua or something like, uh, like the 
poverty, man. And I, like, I just like, um, not that acute so much as that, but it reminded me a lot of it where people are just living day to day, like trying to sell enough to get by today. So like get, have enough to eat today, pay, pay the rent today. And, let, uh, you know, the, the people are really, it really made me sad. Like to see it, I hadn't, I hadn't been exposed to it so much. And where, you know, I, I've seen some, I'm just used to the, the standard of living being much, much, much less here than the U S much less my, I mean, I'm living, I'm in an apartment. I don't have a car. Uh, you know, I don't, I don't have a lot of stuff here. Like, um, so, you know, it's, it's my, my standard of living is much lower and, but people, but it's, it's probably high. It's, it is higher than most people here, but, um, people are starting here and I really got to see the poverty. And I just think it just made me think of, you know, what's going to happen in the upcoming weeks and months, um, as this, um, conflict, you know, continues on and hopefully ends soon. But, um, I just, you know, people are, I don't know, I, I just, a lot of, a lot of nor like middle-class or like people working in the U.S. Just have no idea like how, and, um, you know, and I just, one word on the sanctions, the sanctions aren't, don't hurt. I mean, do you think Vladimir Putin is being hurt person? Do you think he eats less or has, has to, or, or any people in governments have, or any oligarchs like, or have, are struggling in any way on a day-to-day -day scale because they say, no, it's hurting ordinary people. And ordinary people aren't, I mean, the U.S. should know this by now. They sanction, sanction, sanction. The ordinary people don't turn against the government. They turn, it makes them, because the government, you know, is pro whether it's propaganda or whatever, they're saying the United States is doing this to us. So when they, when they say they're doing this to us, the, the people, you know, listen, it's in the news, it's in the media, it's in, you know, conversation, they're not going to go, oh, I'm going to blame Vladimir Putin because of this. No, they're going to blame the U.S. If Vladimir Putin isn't making sanctions on us. It's the United States. It's, it's the West doing this to us, it's Europe doing this. Um, so they're not going to, like, turn. So, I, I, so I, I never understood the sanctions thing, you know. Um, and, and, and one other highlight, you know, the United States just pulled, the United States shouldn't be talking at all about, invasions and all this stuff. and two rights don't make a wrong but they took they killed like over a million people in iraq they uh invasion of afghanistan invasion and occupation for 20 years and then they pull out and that wasn't enough after destroying the infrastructure like putting in puppet government and everything for 20 years occupying a country they pull out not only leaving it in shambles but then they block all humanitarian aid. Not only did they stop humanitarian aid, humanitarian aid to this country of 45 million people, they stopped all humanitarian aid and they blocked any other country, any allied country from giving humanitarian aid, medicine, clothes, um, food, anything for these people. And there's a drought right now, you know, partly because of the destruction, partly because of the weather. There's a drought right now and a famine. And out of 45 million people, they're saying 23 million are at risk for starvation. Like 23 million, not at risk for, oh, uh, they're going to be a little hungry or not have enough. No, no, starvation. 23 million people are at risk. The United States is purposely putting 23 million people in the, the possibility of starvation for to get back at the Taliban government. Who Do you think these people are going to like, protest against the Taliban government because um, of sanctions delivered by the United States, they're going to say the United States is doing this to us. You know, the United States has given Saudi Arabia weapons, an autocratic nation that beheads 20 people every month in public for speaking out against the government, not for being rapists or killers, but for speaking out against the government. They've had 20 people a month in the public square. The United States supports this government that is bombing Yemen and causing another humanitarian crisis where people are already starving to death, literally starving to death. Um, you know, you see it in the, you see the pictures, see the, like the reports, see the, um, the videos of so the people are starving to death. The United States like is allowing this kind of humanitarian disasters to happen. And it's just really, 
it's really frustrating. Like all of a sudden they care about the people of Ukraine. They don't care about the people of Ukraine. If they cared about the, like I said before, if they cared about the people of Ukraine, they would not be arming Ukraine to keep this war continuing. They would be ending this war, so. Well, I think that's fair. And I think it's important you, you know, again, uh, context, America, Americans are so used to thinking that we're an exceptionally and intrinsically good and moral nation. And in order to do that, we have to just be completely historically ignorant and, and, and illiterate. We have to ignore our own foundings based on genocide of indigenous people and of slavery. And we have to be ignorant of, of the, of, of our of the oppression our government places on us internally, uh, and 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 all the devastation that we wreak on the rest of the world, and then and only then can we say, "Hey, we've got to do something." Hey, man, like definitely something's got to be done. Peace needs to be negotiated there. But if you think the United States military is is the answer to the solution, I think that means someone hasn't been paying enough attention to the to what the United States military actually yeah. has always, always, always done. Um, so no, I think I'm, I really appreciate that perspective and and your and your uh, your honesty with that. I wanted to end just I don't know how much uh, all of this tumult has affected your all's uh, schedule and stuff like that. But I did want to ask you about the Jeff Munson School and how training has been there and how things are going with the, the people and, and the kids that uh, you work with. Uh, well, that, that so as 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 of now, the schools haven't been affected. Um, you know, and this is another big worry. You know, we worry about. Uh, you know the economy, you know crumbling because we're 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 school. Um, the, all our all our schools are free, so we have like twenty two schools now, and they're all free for kids, um, and they're doing good. And um, actually, we have a tournament uh, the day after tomorrow and on Sunday. So big, our first tournament with all our with all our schools being invited. So we're looking forward to that. But um, yeah, we're, we're worried about the economy. You know, like uh, you know if we the government isn't paying the salaries of our coaches and stuff like that because we're not asking the kids to pay anything so mm -hmm. um the, the money's got to come from somewhere um to pay the coaches to, to coach these kids so um yeah like the schools are doing great and i'm really i couldn't be happier it's it makes my heart happy i'm gonna be really happy on sunday seeing these kids compete actually and probably the out of you know all these could probably 99% of them, if not like close to 100%, have never competed in a, in a tournament or anything before. So this will be like a really good experience for everybody. So, you know, I'm looking forward to that. And, um, you know, but, you know, I wanted to, you know, I want to have, you know, 200, 300 schools. So um, obviously there can't be a war on and stuff like that. And, and actually, I want to say in uh, Donetsk and Lugansk, um, I met, it's funny because I see these guys on, on TV, like every night on the news, the, the president of Donetsk, the president of Gantz, you know, doing their, what this, you know, talking about the conditions and stuff. I'm like, man, I saw these guys three months ago. I'm meeting with them, but we're, our meeting, man, I was, we we're talking about opening schools in Lugansk and Donetsk, free schools, and they're all for it. And, and I was, I, I said, I was supposed to be there already, mm -hmm. uh, meeting with them about like the, exactly how we were doing it they agreed and and principal already and how we're it, and all this obviously been put on the back burner but um um you know i think like after this this is over um this this war is over that you know it's a war it's not even a conflict it's, it's really a war people are dying so after this war is over we're gonna get these schools open like because i think uh at that time it's more important than ever um you know to have to have these schools and you know, and have these kids have something to look forward to other than like oh my god we just were in a war and now like we're just crumbling okay well let's do some sport let's let's like keep occupied let's find some constructive um place to put your energy and stuff like that I and mean, there's there's nothing better i was at the world championship of grap the last time i was there i was in uh Krakow, Poland, and I was represent, actually representing the United States at this tournament. Um, there are people from Russia, Poland, U.S., all over Europe, Brazil, you know, Brazilians, the Japanese were there, the Chinese had a team, Canada had a team, um, like all of you, like, it's, it's huge. I was like, you know, dozens and dozens of countries represented. And man, you know, everybody wanted to win. You want to win, you were the champion of the world. But man, at the end of the tournament, when I was in the finals, Man, I saw a huge change. It was like 
everybody helping one another, everybody supporting one another, people from different Greece, a guy from Greece, like showing me, hey, okay, like, look at the, you know, I, I saw in the match you did this, but did you try this and stuff like that? And people helping each other, people cheering, man, and the cheerly, cheering in the stands and stuff was like phenomenal. And um, like just everybody helping and cheering and clapping and, and trading, trading their team uniforms for different countries and stuff like that. And it was like, honestly, like out of my sports experiences, it's, it might be the most, uh, it was one of the most emotional, great moments of my life, sports wise, for sure, to see this, like, and the next day they had a, um, a big uh, tour that we all went together. And it was, I mean, it took another emotional twist because we went to uh, Auschwitz and visited there. And, but imagine all these guys that trying to beat each other up and win this championship. The next day we're all in tears, you know, walking through Auschwitz and stuff. But um, it was like, we do this together, man. And there was like the language barriers, all this stuff were just like forgotten. There was no politics. I guess that's the point I'm trying. There's no politics. They're like sport brought us all together and, and unified us all from different countries, different cultures, different backgrounds, different. We all had the same job. We all wanted to win, but we cared about each other even more than more than we wanted to win. And that was like the beauty of um, you know, you're in jiu-jitsu, you know this. So this was like such a a great, a great moment. And I, I want to leave this on this good moment, you know, of all this war and all this bad stuff. But um, you know, you asked about sport and like I, I still that's when I when I see these kids and we go to this tournament on Sunday and and these young kids, we want to teach them, you know, people who are sportsmen and who grew up in sports and learn cooperation and friendship and and doing your best and trying your best and working hard and achieving goals, but also helping others along the way and being helped by others along the way and learning this. Um, it seems like that's a good way to, you know, that if we were all that way in society that uh, we wouldn't have these, we wouldn't be having wars and these kind of conflicts and stuff like that. So that's my, you know, I try to, I want to, you know, ask about the schools that it's not just to teach in sport, not just to teach in jujitsu, you're speaching, you're teaching like, Humanity, humanity, you're teaching love and respect and discipline and hard work and caring for other other people and stuff like that. So, um, you know, that's that's why it gives me such pleasure to do this. Not just like, oh, we're gonna win. It's like, and I don't care who wins this tournament on Sunday because they're all my students. I just want I just want the best for everyone. You know. That's beautiful. And uh, we'll we'll uh, stop the recording here in a moment. And I'll ask you to just stay for a moment after we stop the recording to cut out. But uh, really appreciate your your time and your generosity. It's it's extremely uh, uh, either late in the day or early in the morning where you are, yet you you took the time to uh, uh, and shortly after a fight and right before you have you know your tournament for your for your kids, took the time to discuss a, a lot of uh, a lot of really important stuff. So I really appreciate your time, Jeff. Thank you so much. Uh, thanks for having me. I appreciate it.